Oh, Jeremy, we're in a car. We are in a car. Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. If you're listening versus watching, you're going to miss out on the full experience because I am in a car with Andrew and Tommy Given, and we are headed to Philadelphia for Free Training Day Mid-Atlantic. Now, this episode is not about that. This episode is about what? Two schools of thought. Should testing be mandatory mm. or optional? Mm. So, of course, we're going to uh, not include in that conversation schools where there is no testing because those schools do exist. That is irrelevant to our conversation, but let's acknowledge it here that it does exist. Before we get into the meat of the conversation, please... Make sure you check out WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for all of the things that we have going on with this show, transcripts and what's not, signing up for newsletters and such, so you can get all the behind the scenes. And of course, if you're new to what we do, Whistlekick.com is how you would find out about things like our events, like the one that we're going to, or the other content we produce beyond martial arts radio, as well as the products that we make, all the things that we do to support you as traditional martial artists of the world. There's a speed trap ahead. There's a speed trap ahead. <laughs> and see, one of the fun things about these car episodes is they're about as raw as you get. Yep. So, yeah, I'm not going to edit that out. No, no, there's no, there's no point. So, and I, and I was thinking when you were saying if you're listening, you're going to miss out. Well, if they're listening, they're definitely going to tell we're in a car either way because I'm sure the ambient noise of driving is more than regular episodes. I'm sure it is. Yeah. I hope it is. Otherwise, that speaks poorly of our regular episodes. Oh, that's fair. It's not that quiet. That's fair. All right, Andrew, set us up. All right. So, uh, first off, Tommy. Yes. It's great to have you here with us. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, you're our... F- uh, this will be our second... Tommy, make sure you sit forward. Make sure you project there. Because that's... I'm not saying, like, do anything dangerous if we get in an accident. But oh, just yeah, please know that that's... <laughs> that's where the mic is. I told you, if you're not watching, you're missing... Especially this one. So I was going to say, this will be the second Two Schools of Thought where we've had three people on. Because mm. uh, I did an episode with Nick Tabor and Stephen Watson. Yep. Uh, and so it's kind of cool. Great. It's, it's, cool. it's great to have a, a, a third uh, voice on this episode. So uh, setting, up, setting this up, I don't remember who sent this to me, but this was sent by uh, someone on the team as to Two Schools of Thought. Should testing be mandatory? Or should it be optional? So before the we, we go any further, I need to mention... There's a speed trap ahead. He needs to mention there's a speed trap ahead. Beyond that, testing in my school is optional. This was something that was important to me to construct. And, you know, we can talk about the... the um, well, we're going to end up talking about the why, but I can talk about maybe I should explain what that means and how that happens before we go further. Okay. It's actually optional in my school as well. Oh, interesting. So so here's what we do. My students at any time, within reason, can ask to be evaluated, and that's the term that we use. It's an evaluation. You can be evaluated on some of the curriculum or all of the curriculum, and it's run like a low-pressure test. It's solo with you and one instructor. The premise being, where are you? We have semi-objective standards. We have we have, a, have metrics. So for example, a back fist is part of our curriculum. In order to progress to yellow belt, you have to do a number of things, but your back fist has to be at a level one. I'm not going to go into what that means. For blue belt, you need to be at level two. Green, three, brown, four, black, five. So your evaluation determines where you are at. And once you have checked all your boxes, and the best comparison I have for this is like Boy Scouts, right? You've got your requirements. Once those requirements are in, then you are eligible for testing. At that point, the student needs to express, I want to do this. But the first part of it is on the student. We do, I might once in a while mention to a student like, is, is evaluation and testing something that is of interest to you? Mm. But it, the onus is on them. They have to come forward and say, I want to evaluate. 
So I'll put a pin in that and maybe Tommy wants to talk about what his format is. So mine's actually fairly similar and we don't do an evaluation in that sense. Um, but what it is, is if I see the desire, or they express the desire to want to go ahead and test for the next sash or maybe a promotion in some way else. Some of the arts that I do teach, like you mentioned earlier, do not have testing. There's no testing in Tai Chi. There's no testing in Kali. However, in the Kung Fu end of it, in the Aikido end, there is. So, it really depends on the individual. I do have some students that go from a desire to learn one thing and then their interest changes. So that puts a different emphasis on what they want to do. In the testing part, when they make that desire known, I will give them a sheet of what I'm looking for. Mm. And then they have time to go with that sheet. When we finally do test, though, it's a party. It's open to the public. I have people come in. I we have guest uh, judges, you know, um, even guys like yourself, if you wanted to hang out. And, and so that it becomes more of an environment where everyone is included. If someone's not testing that day, they're still allowed to come and, and hang out and participate. Because not everybody's looking for that necessarily the accomplishment of having a speed ahead. Hey, um, sash or diploma or whatever have you. So uh, I generally don't do things traditionally in my school other than the form itself. That's pretty much the only. Okay. What's okay. How, how? So, how are you used? To, you, you have a school coming. Mm -hmm. How are you going to do it? Because I'm pretty sure you're going to do it a little differently than we do. So, I look at it. What? What's the rationale? My first thing my head goes to is what's my rationale or our rationale for testing in general. Sure. Like there are schools that don't whether it's Tai Chi or boxing or Kali or whatever, why do we do testing? And I'm going to answer for myself. It's so that I and, and other students can have uh, an indication as to where they are in the curriculum, where they are in, to some degree, ability. That's not to say that someone with a lower rank couldn't necessarily be better at something than someone at a higher rank, but in general, I think that's fairly In, in the traditional model, that's yeah. usually how we look at it. And so, then my head goes to, if I had a student, and this has never, this has never come up in any schools that I have helped run, um, you know, I don't currently own a school, but it's in the works, um, or managing a school, I've not had a student come to me and say, know sensei or you have told me that I'm testing in a month and I don't want to I haven't had that happen but my head then goes to what would be the downside of saying okay you don't have to test so do you guys and I have one but I want to is there a downside to having a student continue to train in our in our arts and not actually test. It depends on the curriculum and how it's formatted. Okay. So, again, one of my goals in setting this out was how do I create an environment where people can show up occasionally as visitors or, you know, they leave for a month or maybe it's a kid, they're leaving for a sports season and they don't feel like they're behind. That's something we, we, I talk about with schools I consult with. It's something we've heard about on episodes. And I, I wanted to, I, I thought I could find a way and so I did. So there are speed traps ahead. Oh, plural this time. So my curriculum is simple. There are 25 techniques. You are expected to know all of them for a yellow belt. You just have to know them better as you progress. The other things we have are the implementation, sparring, and forms. We have five forms, kata. You are not required to know anything beyond the first form for your first rank. 
in most schools, that would be gate kept. You would not be able to learn the second form until you reach that rank. Mm. I do not feel the need to, to gatekeep that. I'm not going to tell someone, you don't want to promote, you know your first form, you can't learn the second form. Okay, so you know all the material really well and you just don't have a belt. I don't care. Mm. Mm -hmm. Tommy, do you have any thoughts on that? So the only time that I would see hurting somebody is somebody who was really a goal-oriented individual and they're looking for that to establish where they're at personally, then I would encourage them to, to go for the next sash or for the next belt if it's in a keto. However, I don't see a, a real downside to forcing that upon anybody. Jeremy said, based on the individual. When I teach, everyone's in the same room. So the black belts, mm -hmm. they're with the white belts, and they're doing the same thing. How they accomplish that can be differently, greatly different. So, but that's something that I'm able to watch and see the progress. Now, for the sake of if they're entering tournaments, that kind of thing, does go by rank, that's where it comes important. So somebody's very interested in that side of Kung Fu or Karate or just demonstrating even when it comes to forms, they may not want to like sparring, but they don't want to do forms, then I encourage them to go for rank. Mm -hmm. So this way they can be in the peer group that's most appropriate yeah. at that time. So I was gonna I was gonna bring yeah. up yeah, what's yours? What are the well, so you, you said you had a, a, a downside. Maybe you're, you're leading up yeah. to that. I just want to make it so. Uh, one of them is the tournament thing, which I'll get to. But the first one I thought of is, and and I'm I am definitely going extreme because I want to make sure we look, look at both of sides of this. <laughs> but uh, and we talked something about this years ago. Uh, when you started training at a new school and you went in as a white belt. And the, the I don't wanna say problem I have with that because I didn't have a problem with it, but the, the thing that came to me was if I was a brand new student in that class and I saw you with a white belt on, I would be like, why am I here? Like <laughs> this guy is a white belt and he's so good. Oh my gosh, why should I even bother to try? And if I have a student in my school that has been training for 15 years with me and has just never tested and is still continuing to wear a white belt, any new student I have come in might see that as a barrier. Sure. Um, now, now, that's now, a simple solve. Absolutely. It's just a discussion with the student. Hey, just so you know. It's a discussion or... You know, if that person... So in my school, they're not wearing white belts, but it, it's it's the same thing, right? Yeah. So it, it um, because of the culture that is being created without belts... I have students that have been training a year. They know the material. Mm -hmm. They've never wanted to evaluate. And I do my best to kind of... And this is going to lead into the negative I see, because nothing's perfect, uh, as I gently prod them... Right? Like, I'm like, eh. If a new student comes in and they see, oh, that person over there seems to know the material way better than the people over here, there could be a discussion. Mm. What I find more is that that new person, no matter what's going on around them, thinks that they don't know anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it, it, it's, it's almost irrelevant, not yeah. entirely. But here's the place that I think it actually really does matter. How many people have test anxiety? How many people struggle to, with being challenged? We have people on the core team, I'm not gonna name their names, some of them will watch or listen to this episode, where I have challenged them to do certain things in their lives in affiliation with Whistlekick that they did not want to do, that they are better off, admittedly, objectively, better off in their lives because I challenged them. Mm -hmm. And I am removing with my school the way 
the, the one of the ways that an instructor might often accomplish that. Mm. So, here's a question for you both. Why, what are some reasons that students would not want to test? You mentioned one, test anxiety. Are there other reasons that a student might say, I, I don't want to test? Here's a stumbling block for me is, um, I loved competing. No doubt, and I enjoyed uh, getting in there, training for it, um, going forward, and, and maybe as a you know, as a green belt going into the next division. I remember that when I was younger, and I've had students come up and they have absolutely zero desire to compete. So you know, it's hard. It was hard for me to come up with a way like. I couldn't relate to that. I, I honestly could not relate to the point of, what do you don't want to compete? And then I realized that, well, you know, not everybody's made the same, obviously, but to find ways to challenge them, going for a test was a good way to do that. But they didn't have to compete. They didn't have to really challenge themselves in that manner. They get their anxiety going like crazy. It was enough anxiety for them just to show up that day. So I had to take a step back and present it in that manner. So it was really hard for me to get to that grip. But once I figured out what makes them There's tick, a stalled vehicle ahead. Oh, okay. Like that's a vehicle true. ahead. Uh, then, it, then it became easier. So you didn't go where I thought you were going to go with the tournament thing. I can, but... For me... A, a downside or a reason or rationale that someone might not want to test is they're a strong competitor and they oh. go to tournaments and they compete in the green belt level or the brown belt level or wherever and they're ready to test for black belt but if they do now when they go to tournaments they're not going to win all the time and you know in, in the drumming world we, we call that sandbagging right there they're, they're holding themselves back in the next level from going to the next level so that they can continue to be better than everyone else. You find people do that on purpose. That's my. That's what I'm saying. That there is a, a, a lot... I don't know how broad the occurrence is, but there is a discussion in the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu world that is fairly loud on this subject that I have witnessed. Uh, and, and here... So, first off, here's my response. Uh, if you care that much about getting your blue belt medal or blue belt trophy or whatever, right, your lower rank, um, you should be embarrassed. You should be ashamed of yourself. That's that it f completely flies in the face of everything that martial arts stands for. No um, argument. Um, could there be reasons I'm not thinking of for for holding yourself back for competition? Sure, but. I'm, I'm viewing it now. You're welcome to challenge me if you have another way of thinking of it. Let me know. But here's... Where was I going? You said something... Oh, here, here's a reason that doesn't have to do with test anxiety that I think is quite legitimate. And I think back to... When I was a kid, I loved reading. I read all the time. I read on the bus. I read every book I could get my hands on. And when I got into high school... And I was expected to take all these notes and memorize all these things and be tested on those books. My love for reading was destroyed. Mm. And I went to college and it got worse. And so I went from the kid who read every book, you would not have found me without a book prior to ninth grade, to someone who writes more books than he reads. Mm. That's interesting. That is interesting. It's not an avenue I would have thought of, but it does make sense. If I was going to train somewhere at this point, let's say it was on occasion. I don't care about rank. I don't care about testing. I want to learn your material. Mm -hmm. Now, that school's probably going to give me an easy way to do that because they probably just have me wear my black belt. That's yep. fine. Yep. Yep. But if they didn't want me to do that, I would have no problem wearing a white belt and never testing mm -hmm. because I just want the material. And there, there is a personality type 
that does not want the pressure of standardization, evaluation. They simply want participation. Mm. Yep, yep. Anything to add? Well, I find that more prevalent in my Tai Chi class, where they just want to participate. Sure. For whatever reason, the healing part or the movement part or low impact or learning the martial art part of it. So I'm wondering if if this goes down the aisle or what someone should choose, and this is a question for you guys then, an art that would go for that personality? Like if you're going into a, you know what I'm trying to say or not? Yeah, I, I think that's a, I think that could be a whole episode unto itself, okay. it's a broad subject, but I, I, I think it's absolutely valid to pose that question yeah. here and the audience can, can start to contemplate that as, as we also do. Because I never saw that coming with the reading. Yeah, no, I, I get was, that. I get it. I it get makes that. sense. So, uh, the next thing I'm thinking is, for students that do have test anxiety, or... Let, 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 me, let me pause on that one. The other thing is, like you said, I, I just, I don't care about rank. Like, I just, I want to I wanna come in and... And I, I respect that and can relate very, very much. But if that's also the case, you should have no problem if the instructor does come to you and say, you know what, I would really like you to test. No, I, I really don't it's care. I really don't before. care. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, you know, I really don't care. Okay, well, you already have a black belt. We know you can test. Well, I think it's, and I'm pretending I'm the instructor, like, I, I think it's, it, it looks a little inappropriate for you to wear a white belt. Um, in our school, can you wear a green belt? Because that's where you are now. Like, you didn't have to test, but here you go. Sure. Right, and if if you are of the feeling that you don't care about rank and you don't care that you test or not, if this instructor does come to you and say they want you to, I think you should be okay saying, "All right, well, I guess I will." I guess I will. If you really don't care, then that means you don't have a preference one way or the other, so you should be okay testing. Now, for the students that have test anxiety, I totally get that, I, and I have had students that have had that come up, and I think that is a, uh, a conversation between them and the instructor to talk about how to get over that. I do think there are a lot, and I think all three of us would agree, there are huge benefits to being able to get over, and uh, get over is a bad use of words, to work through that anxiety. To accept the challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And maybe that is your test is slightly different from other people's tests. Maybe it's not in a huge group with lots of people, but that can still be something that happens. If if your rational rationale for not testing is strictly because you're you're afraid of the test itself, I think that's a discussion for you, that you can have with your with your your instructor. That's really interesting because you said problem and work through in many ancient languages like the Greek actually Japanese as well as Chinese the word you use for problem means work through mm -hmm. so to to go through that mm -hmm. I think you really hit the, the nail on the head Andrew yeah so so fascinating two two more things I want to throw on the pile here we're talking about the first is that test anxiety that conversation if you have a young child or someone who is still new and you don't have a strong relationship. In a lot of schools, that first test occurs, you know, three months in. Mm -hmm. it's yep. true. You don't have a strong relationship. And I, I'm not gonna guess how many students have bailed on training because of test anxiety, but it's not zero. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing, and this is something I, I have witnessed and I, I, it drives me crazy, instructors teaching to the test. instructors teaching to the test that sure your material that you are teaching should be correlated to your curriculum and if you have a test hopefully your curriculum lines up to your test however there's an object on road ahead I have seen circumstances where an instructor might say we have testing coming up in a few weeks. I want to get you ready. And there's just something about that that rubs me the wrong way. I don't even know if I can articulate it. 
I, I, th I think, I'm speculating about my own mind here. I think it has to do with if your instruction was lined up properly, you, your, your class should already get people there in the approximate timeline you would want them, right? The, the three testing classes curriculum should already be lined up. And if you have to deviate, yeah. then it suggests that you, you need to make an adjustment there, which, you know, uh, as a, a, a tangent, we did that in my school. We found that it was taking people longer on their forms than on their basics. So we made a small adjustment to the frequency and the amount of time we devote to forms versus basics. But what I think it is, is, you know, most of us have had the experience in our academic career where, I guess we'd go back to books quite often, instead of fully understanding Romeo and Juliet or Othello or, or something from Shakespeare by immersing yourself in that play, reading the play in entirety, you go through a read, memorize, regurgitate, cliff notes sort of methodology, which on the test suggests you understand the material, but can you apply it? Yeah. yeah. If you memorize a particular self-defense sequence, and does that necessarily mean that you can apply it in a real-world confrontation? Obviously, no. And so I think that's where my objection comes in. I, I get it. But I, I want to put a big pause on that because that is, that's totally separate. And that's a totally new episode, You're right. which I'm going to make a note for because we're going to do an episode about that for sure. Uh, but getting back to should testing be mandatory? Should a student be allowed to say they're not ready to test? And I think for me, it comes down to a, a discussion between the student and the instructor as to the why and what their rationale it's is funny. for it not. It back to why. Yeah, yeah. It always comes back to why. why um, you know, I could see situations where allowing a student to not test could would be fine, but I don't know that I would be comfortable with a student saying no to a test multiple times in a row. Like if they've been, you know, if they were eligible for testing and this time and they say no, okay, well, next time around, maybe you'll feel ready and then they're not the next time. If that happened multiple times, I, I think it would be even more discussion as to, you know, let's talk about this. To what out. age group are you thinking of that were? I'm not, I, for me, I, there's no age limit. Okay. I, I don't have an age in my head for this. Okay. You, Jeremy. Closing, closing thoughts. Um, I wish I had a little more room for that card. Uh, there's no perfect answer, right? And this is one of those that I would simply hope that those of you out there who have the responsibility for making this determination in your school at least consider why. Right? If you have testing and you encourage testing and push testing simply because that's how you were raised, break it back down. What would it look like for you in your school if it was optional? What changes would that require? And run through that mental exercise because you'll probably find some things you say, you know, I bet we could do this better or that better. And I think that, that private personal discussion is 100% worthwhile. Tommy? I think you guys both covered it well. So the only thing I would add would be back to the why again. Uh, you know, why is this person have, have this roadblock? What can I do to help you get over that roadblock? How can I hold your hand? Nah, not hold your hand, but how can I assist you in getting over this together? Because many of those times, their roadblocks are something I've experienced myself, one way or another. So, um, and that's really it. It's All right. Well, there you go. Remember, whistlekick.com for all the things that we do to connect, educate, and entertain you, the traditional martial artists of the world. Thank you for your time.
time. Thank you for spending some of it with us. We appreciate you. And don't forget to share this episode with other people that you think might enjoy it. If you have a suggestion for a topic or a guest, reach out to this guy right here, Andrew at Whistlekick.com, and uh, we'll see what we can do. Thanks, everybody. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>